You're listening to Nightlight. Hi, and welcome to another edition of Nightlight. And let's welcome back on the show David Kiran. And we're speaking together over Skype. David is in Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm in Kampala, Uganda. Always great to have you on the show, David. Welcome back. It's good to be back. This is fun. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. David, at the end of the last show, when you were teaching on the wisdom books, you said that you had a class on faith. So I've been looking forward to that. Let me tell you first how this this discussion came about and the interesting study that I did on it. I've always wondered about childlike faith. You know, we hear this concept a lot, the faith of the little child and just to have that trust as a little child. And Jesus himself commended it a lot. You see in the book of Matthew, he says that, you know, unless you have faith as a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that is absolutely great. And that is beautiful. And that is super, super important. I mean, Jesus himself said it. Obviously, it is important. Right. So I was thinking about it. What is a faith as a little child? Faith as a little child is basically just complete and utter trust that the person who says he's going to do something is actually going to do it. He doesn't need all the whys and the wherefores or all the understanding or all the other things behind it. He just needs to know that my father said it and it is so. It's a complete and utter trust in it. Yes. And that's the faith of like the smallest little child as well. It's that sincere belief. However, I realized that was a little bit of an incorrect supposition because I realized that I haven't really spent much time around kids to come up with that conclusion. What uh -huh. I realized is when you spend time around kids, they never take your word for it at first saying. They will ask you a million and one questions about that thing. Right. Why, why, why this, why that? Is this correct? Is that correct? Did you really say this and all those different things? But at the end of the day, they will trust you implicitly and they'll take your word it's for it. It's true. And so that kind of got me thinking about this faith as a little child kind of a thing, because I find it pretty interesting that sometime in the pursuit of childlike faith, we can occasionally have what we call childish faith. Hmm. And while I feel the Bible calls us to childlike faith, the Bible warns us against having childish faith. And we see this very clearly in one of Paul's letters. If you have your Bible, can you pull up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20? It says, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. So a very interesting verse here. So he yes. says that you do not be childish in your understanding. Be as grown men in your understanding. Yes. So I thought about that and I said, okay, so there's a very interesting tension over here. We are supposed to be childlike in our faith, but we are supposed to be like grown ups in our understanding. And as we know, if, if what Paul said is true, that faith comes by hearing the word of God, then we are supposed to be grown ups in regards of our understanding of the Bible in order to then have childlike faith. Right. And this is an angle that I'd never seen it from before, because a lot of people, they feel that in order to have childlike faith, they actually don't need to know that much. They actually don't need to study the word that well. They don't need to have all biblical knowledge. All they need to do is just have faith like a little child. It's true. That is true initially right the bible says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that ye may grow thereby and you also have a conversations which happens in the beginning of first corinthians where paul talks about when a baby is born you first feed him milk but then eventually you have to transition them off milk onto meat otherwise they're not going to grow beyond a certain point and i think it's pertinent that a little bit further on we get this verse in chapter 14 of corinthians where he talks about, look, you need to be grown ups in your understanding. You have to be grown ups in your knowledge of the word in order that you can have the right type of faith. Yes. So that really got me thinking. So then I, I wanted to look back and see, okay, 
So is this true? How did this tension between faith and knowledge kind of play itself out within the early church? Because that's what you should do, right? When you read the Bible, as as applicable as it is to us today, it was also written for a people in a certain time, in a certain context. Right. And so if you want to understand exactly what it's saying in order to apply it to your life today, you need to know certain aspects of the history of when it was written to and how it was applied back then. Because we know how it was applied back then, you have a better understanding of how to apply it right now. And so I started doing some research into the early church. And what I came up with from my study was actually super interesting. I personally found it completely shocking initially. And then everything kind of made sense after understanding that. If you actually want to do a study on this yourself, I would encourage you to do so. There is a very interesting branch of early church history called the history of normative philosophy. That is something that is worth going and studying if you're interested in this particular point more. Okay. But I'm going to give it to you as a summary. Okay. Okay. Did you know that Christianity was the very first religion that made belief crucial. Explain. No other religion up until the time of Christianity said that you had to believe in anything particular. Belief was never essential to the religion. Why? Because it was always a sacrifice-based religion. Hmm. If you look at any of the other cultures that were available at that time, and at the time of Jesus in the Greco-Roman world, 95% of the world followed after either the Greek gods or the Roman gods or the Egyptian gods or whatever gods they had over there. It really didn't matter what you thought about the gods. In fact, you read the Greek and Roman writings about their gods. Majority of their gods are absolutely terrible people. Right. But it really didn't matter because what you thought about them, whether you thought they were good or bad or weird or whatever it was, all you had to do was go make your sacrifice or go pour the wine out of your glass on the altar or do your couple of visits to the temple every month. And then that way you appease them. They stayed out of your life and you kind of lived okay. And so the whole thought of religion in the ancient world was all about what you needed to do to keep God off your chest. Right. Or the multiple gods. You wanted it to rain, here's the sacrifice you had to make. You wanted to have prosperity, you didn't want your children to die, here's the sacrifice that you had to make. And most of the time you had no clue what these gods wanted because you knew nothing about them. And so you would go to the priest and you would ask the priest, what's the God's mood? And the priest would weigh it up and, you know, throw a couple of things and gamble some bones and probably listen to an oracle and stuff like that and say, okay, so the God wants A, B, C, D. And then you did it. And then you come back the next week after something's gone wrong. And you said, hey, I did A, B, C, D. It didn't work. And they say, oh, actually, the God wanted this and this. And there's some other God that's causing a problem because these two guys don't like each other. And so you kind of have to figure that out. It was like a lottery system (laughs) with these chaps, but it was all based upon on your sacrifice of different things. It had nothing to do with your concept of what these guys were. They were good or bad, or it doesn't matter. It doesn't, there's nothing to it. You just have to come here to this particular temple, make this particular pilgrimage, offer this particular sacrifice, and your life is pretty much sorted. That's right. This was 95% of the world at the time of Jesus. The other 5% were the Jewish people. Now, the Jewish people knew more about God. They understood a bit of his nature because his nature was what was revealed to them through the Torah and through the old Jewish scriptures. And so they had an understanding of him, but still their religion was based around the sacrifice element of it. It was. You still went, you still made your sacrifices, and that's what basically kept you on an even standing with God. Your salvation was based on the fact that you're part of the covenant and the fact that you went to Jerusalem once a year to make your sacrifices in the temple. And so all of the religion in the world up until the time of Jesus was always predicated on the sacrifice offerings. Yes. Belief wasn't a very crucial part of this entire thing. No. However, out comes the Christians. And here the Christians say that what you need to be saved is not to make your own sacrifice, but to believe that God made that sacrifice for you. 
And then because of that belief that God made the sacrifice for you, you then give your life in service to him. Now, hold on a minute. If all you need to do to be saved is not to do a sacrifice of your own, not to enter under any particular covenant, you know, not do the circumcision of the Jews or not go to the temples like the other people and offer this sacrifice or put this idol up in your house. If all you needed to do was just to believe that this person gave up their life for you, that this person was God descended from heaven who lived a, an earthly life and then died for your sin. So that way belief in him could bring you, restore you in right relationship with God, could cover up all your sins and then take you into heaven when your life was over so that you would have eternal life. Then suddenly there came the necessity to know everything about this particular person because you can't believe in what you don't know. If belief now becomes the most crucial act of your faith, suddenly now knowing what to believe in becomes the most crucial part of your religious life. Yes. I'll say that again. If what makes you saved, right, is belief in the sacrifice of this person, then knowing who this person is, what sacrifice they made, and why they did it becomes your most crucial religious duty. Because you can go through your entire life believing this and then find out at the end of your life that you're wrong and you're screwed. And so you really want to get this correct. And so I think it's kind of interesting, right? In, in our modern day culture, we just naturally accept that we need to believe in things because we've had 2000 years of this. But when Christianity first came out telling everyone that all they need to do was believe, that was a very, very earth shaking statement. Right. And it was pretty scary to tell people that there was no more sacrifices required. They didn't have to go to any temples or make any sort of pilgrimages. They didn't have to enter under any sort of covenant like their Jewish brothers. All they need to do was just believe in what God had done for them. Now, to believe in what someone has done for you, you got to know that. And you got to know it well because you're going to be basing your life on it. And not just your earthly life, you're going to be basing your afterlife on it. Where you're going to spend eternity comes down to this one thing, what you believe in. And so this is why, if you notice, belief was so crucial to the people of the early church. And you see, Paul talks about this. Can you get me uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, very, very interesting. Follow Paul's train of thought here. Paul says, I've told you about the, the gospel. I have preached it to you. You have received it. You stand on it. You make a stand of faith on it. And because of that, you are saved. Very, very crucial. He says, is your belief. And there is a process by which that belief comes. He says, I've told it to you. You have received it. You have stood on it. And because of standing on it, you are saved. And this was revolutionary in the world at that particular time. But that was all it took. And the Christians went on affirming this in every single place that that was all it took. You see Peter telling Cornelius that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You have Paul telling people in the book of Acts as well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see it all throughout the New Testament as well. If you can also pull up uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 11. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, so now Paul over here once again repeats the same thing. 
he says, the word is nigh, even in thy mouth and even in thy heart. He says, so it's your understanding of the word. Once you take it in and once you put it in your heart and once you believe it in your heart, then you are able to say it and verbalize it of a truth. And he says, when you do that, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all it takes, confessing it with your mouth and believing it in your heart. And then he says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. He says, when you believe it in your heart, when you truly get it, he says, that is when your heart believes unto righteousness. And when you confess it with your mouth, he says, that is when you have salvation. And he says, the scripture says, whoever believes will not be ashamed. The early Christians made a very, very distinct challenge here. And it opened up a very interesting paradox as well as solution. You needed, in order to understand that God through Jesus saved you, you had to know about God. You had to know about Jesus. You had to know about what he did. And then you had to know about what you did in your life and about why you were a sinner and fallen from grace. You had to accept that you had to believe that the sacrifice of Jesus could pay for it, and then you had to act upon that belief. And then that is what brought your salvation. Yes. And so from the very beginning, all the way from the book of Corinthians onwards, and the book of Corinthians was one of the earliest books of the Bible that was written that we can date in the New Testament. The book of Corinthians was written about 15 years after the death of Jesus. That's quite close. It was. And in Ooh. it, Paul talks about traditions of faith that he received from the apostles within seven years of the death of Jesus. And so from the very beginning, this was a very key concept that you needed to know what you believed. You needed to know why you believed it. And then you had to act upon it. And so they called this the regula fide. The regular fide is a Latin word, which basically means the rule of faith. Okay. These were core beliefs about God, about Jesus, and about humankind that helped to explain your faith. And once you believed them and accepted them and acted upon them, that brought about your salvation. And this regular fide is what eventually became the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, which are still used in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches around the world today. These were formed back in the first few centuries of Christianity. And why were they formed? You know, we only have one word for belief in our English language, right? It's belief. Right. But in Latin, they had three words for belief, which I think are truly awesome. Okay? Belief, they had three words. The first word was notitia. Okay, notitia meant to notice something. Notitia. And then the second word they had was essentia. And the word essentia basically meant to agree with it. And then the third word was fiducia. And the word fiducia meant to act upon it. So let me give you an illustration tying in all these words. Okay. Notitia. Essentia, fiducia, noticing it, agreeing to it, acting on it. Let's just say that we're going to talk about airplanes. The first word, notitia. We've all noticed airplanes before, right? You've seen it fly overhead. You've seen it in videos. You've watched it in the movies. You know, you've driven by the airport and you see them taking off and landing. You might not know anything else about these airplanes, but you notice them. So if someone says, do you believe in airplanes? Of course, it's there. I see it. I've noticed it before. Do you know anything about it? I know nothing about it. I just see it flying in the air. I don't know why it flies. I don't know anything about the laws of aerodynamics. I don't know anything about anything, but I notice it's there. So if you ask me, it's there? Yeah, because I see it. I notice it. That's the first word. Then you have essentia, which means you agree to it. Someone says, do you believe that airplanes can fly? I do believe that airplanes fly. I agree with you. Why do I agree with it? Because I've done some research into it. Okay? I know that airplanes fly because I know that there are laws of physics and aerodynamics and all those different things, which makes this big, heavy 
this big, huge, heavy plane, it actually allows it to take off the ground and land properly. And there's very minimal risk involved. And I know that it can go very fast and take you across the world and it can fly over oceans and mountains and all that sort of stuff. And so I agree with you that it can fly. And we have an agreement on that. So I've noticed it and I've agreed upon it. But then there's the third element of belief, which we call fiducia, which is the Latin word fiducia, which means to take action upon it. And that is when you actually go and buy your ticket, climb into the plane, sit down, and then actually fly on it. Right. You've gone beyond noticing and you've gone beyond agreeing. You've gone to staking your life on it. Yes. I'm going to risk my life to get into this plane, not knowing whether it's going to get me to my destination because I don't know there. But I believe enough about it and I know enough about it to take action upon my belief. If you don't do that, you'll never travel. You'll never get to the other side of the world and visit all your beautiful destinations. Because that takes taking the belief that you have and putting it into action. And that was the early church understanding when it came to belief. It wasn't enough just to notice these things. It wasn't enough just to agree upon it. You also then had to stake your life upon it because when you acted upon it was when you got the results. When you acted upon your belief, that is when you were saved. And that's why Paul says, first of all, you got to believe in your heart, and then you got to confess it with your mouth. Then you've got to say it that you and actually go and act upon it. And then you change your life according to it. And then this came the third element of what they would do. So in the early church, you see this all the way through the book of Acts. And you see this also looking at early church history through the writings of people like Eusebius and Polycarp and guys like that. When a person wanted to become a Christian, they didn't just pray the salvation prayer right there. No. What would they have to do? They would put them through a period of study. You had to learn about your faith. You had to learn about Christ. You had to learn about the truths of the word, about what he did and how through his death and resurrection, we are reconciled to God and we are brought back into his presence. That was a lot of stuff to learn. Right. And then once they learned it, then and only then once they were ready to make that proclamation of faith, then they were allowed to be baptized. I find this super interesting this concept of it, because in the early church, baptism would always take place in the center of town because towns and cities were always built around lakes and rivers, right? Because they were a viable life source. You would not find cities situated in the middle of the desert. They always had to be around a life source in order to survive. And 99% of the time, that life source was a water body. It was either a river or a lake or a sea or whatever it was. And so when you went down to be baptized, you were literally proclaiming your faith in front of your entire town. Oh, that's interesting. You could never go back and live your regular life once you were finished because everybody saw you go and do it. Right. All your neighbors, all your friends, all your enemies, all your business competitors, everybody saw you go and give your life to Christ. So if you went back and tried to live your life differently the next day, they're like, no, 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 no. That's not who you're supposed to be because you, you said that you were going to become someone else. So you can't go back to your same life you were before. It was an actual disconnect with your old life and a beginning of a new life. And the super cool thing is when they would take them to baptism, what they had to do was they would have to assent and agree to all these different things that were there in the regular fide or the creeds. And so how it work is they would ask the person and they would say, do you believe in God? And they would say, yes, I believe that God is the creator of the universe and that he is, he is a great and holy God who is, you know, infinite, who's been without time. I believe that he is the maker of the world and that he is the sustainer of the world and the ruler and judge of it all. Good. 
Then they would dip them on the water first time, pull them back up, and they'd ask the next time, okay, so do you believe in Jesus? They say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the word. He is one with God, and, you know, he came in flesh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Good. Then they'd do it again. And they would basically make them physically proclaim everything that they believed in. And then once that was finished, then they would have to go out and start living all those truths. And that is what made them a Christian. And that's why we find it quite interesting that in um, the book of Acts, it says that the Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. Why were they first called Christians at Antioch? Because these guys had heard about Christ. They had heard about Jesus and they had heard the rumors being circulated. And then they see this group of people who are living exactly like the stories they've heard. And they said, ha, huh, could it be that these guys are like Christ? And that's where the word Christian came from. Interesting. Like Christ, those who lived like Christ. And so this was the early church's understanding of what it meant to believe. First of all, you needed to notice it. You had to notice that there was a greater truth in this world beyond yourself. The next thing you had to do is you had to agree to it. You had to proclaim that, yes, this is true, and this, I need this in my life. I need the salvation of Jesus Christ. I need him to change my life. I need him to put me in right relationship with God. I see that I have failed. I see all these different things in my life that I'm not living up, and I know that the only true sacrifice that could ever appease God is the life of Jesus. And I know that he did that. And all it takes is me accepting him as my Lord and Savior. And then after they assented to it, then they needed to act upon it. And they acted upon it, first of all, by making a public declaration of it, and then by changing their entire life by it. Wow. And that's why Paul says it takes a grown up to do that. Mm hmm. It really does. It takes you knowing, it takes you understanding, and it takes you coming to depths with your faith. It takes you coming to grips with that. And then once you do, you change your life based on it. And that is how you live belief. And James talks about it very clearly in his epistle as well. James says that faith without works is dead. If you have nothing backing up your faith, you're not living your belief properly. And there's a super incredible verse, which I love. I think is one of the scariest verses in the New Testament, but it's, and you, when you hear it, it just blows you away. Can you look up uh, James? Okay. It's James chapter two, verse, verse 18 through 20. It says, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Mm. So it's super, super interesting what he does here. He says, let me just show you how useless your faith is if you've got nothing, no action backing it up. He says, you believe that there is one God, okay? That is like the basic core tenement. That was the first thing they had to confess at the time of baptism. That was the first basic element of the regular fide and of both the Nicene and the Apostle Creeds. And he says, you believe that first thing, okay, that there is one God. What do you want? You want me to clap for you? <laughs> he says, even the demons in hell believe that there is one God. And they tremor because of it. That's right. But they never change it does nothing to them. That's right. And he says, this is why action is so crucial towards your faith, that acting upon your belief, because that is what takes it from a concept and makes it into reality. He says, this is such an important thing to know. He says, you can't have faith without works. There has to be 
action that follows your faith. You can't just notice it. You can't just agree to it. You should notice it, and you should agree to it. If you haven't noticed it, you better get your Bible and start reading and noticing these things. If you haven't agreed to it, you better get serious with God and really become a man in your understanding of the scriptures. But then you got to translate that into action in every area of your life. And that is what James says brings about the life that God is after. If you really believe in Jesus, if you really believe that he is who he is, and you really believe that he did what he said he did, and that is all we need, then how has that changed your life? How has your life changed because of it? Are you living as a different person, as a new creation because of what God has done for you? Yes. If not, then maybe your belief doesn't go down deep enough. And maybe it's time to stop being childish with your faith and start becoming a grown-up in your understanding, wrestling with the deep truths of the Spirit and start asking yourself, why do I believe what I believe? And once you understand that, once you notice it, and once you agree to it, then you act on it and change your life by it. Inspiring you to draw closer to God, you're listening to Nightlight. And I want to close with a very, very interesting thought that I actually got from from someone. I heard this concept and it completely blew my mind. There is a story in the Old Testament about Jacob. We all know Jacob, right? Jacob, the trickster. Jacob, the, you know, the deceiver. Jacob, who stole his brother's birthright and his blessing through deceit and then had to go and flee because his brother wanted to kill him and then had to go through a lot of difficulty living under his uncle and having that uh, deceit and treachery repaid. And first of all, being given the older daughter to marry and then having to work all the extra years to get everything else. And so his life was a bit of a mess. And there's an interesting story when he has to come back and face his brother. And so he's going back and he doesn't know if his brother is going to kill him or not. Right. Because he's believed in God up until this point, but now he's a little bit worried whether or not he's going to survive. Because God told him that he would carry on the promise of Abraham. That was his birthright. That was the promise. That was the blessing. He was supposed to be the one to carry on the lineage and the promise that God had made to Abraham, which was supposed to span eternity. But he's at this moment where he's not sure if he goes across the river and meets his brother, if he's going to be slain and that promise will be in vain. And so he sends his family over with gifts and presents and all those things to try to appease his brother. And he stays alone by himself one night. And the interesting thing is while he's alone, an angel shows up out of nowhere and he begins to wrestle with the angel and he wrestles with the angel all night long. It's kind of interesting. The angel hits him on the hip and breaks his hip and still he won't let go. He's clinging on to the angel. And in fact, the very weird thing about the story is that he ends up winning this wrestle with the angel. I mean, this is this is a this is a simple mortal man wrestling with a higher power. And he comes out on top. And the interesting thing about the story is, is that that is when his name gets changed. And it's super interesting what his name gets changed to. He is no longer Jacob the deceiver. He becomes Israel, the chosen. And everyone after him received that name, Israel. And the word Israel is super interesting. In ancient Hebrew, the word Israel means the one who wrestles. Really? And when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, what an incredible statement. The word for God's chosen people are those who wrestle with God. Maybe that's what we need to be in order to be 
grown-ups in our understanding. Because there's a lot of deep truths in the Bible that we don't understand and we can't just get in a five-minute reading or in the one hour we spend in church per week. Maybe we do need to make it as our goal to pull our Bibles off our shelves, to read the chapters and verses and things that might have scared us initially that we didn't understand and wrestle with our faith. Amen. Maybe we need to actually really get down to the core of our belief and say, why are these things true? And not just true for me, but true for the entire world at a cosmic level. Because if God is God, he's God over all. And if truth is truth, it's applicable to everything. So you got to know why that is. First of all, you got to notice it. And then you've got to struggle with it till you agree with it. And then once you reach that point of agreement, then the challenge comes to change your life by it because faith produces works. Yes. The final element of belief is when you get up after your wrestle with the angel and then cross over the river and take those promises in hand. When you get up out of that water of baptism and change your life, when you get up from your time of reading and studying, and go on to change your life with the truth of God's word. Because when you change your life, you change your world. And when you change your world, you give the world hope that it can be changed. Do you think that the world needs some changing? I'm sure you do. I'm sure everybody does. Start with changing yourself. And the way that you change yourself is by becoming a grown-up with your faith. First of all, notice it, and then wrestle with it, until you come to an agreement with it, and then let that change your life. Because when that changes your life through positive action, you change your world. And if enough people are changing their world, then there is hope that this entire world can be changed. And that is what belief is all about. Nightlight. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. And our guest on this international edition of Nightlight is David Karan. Thanks for that wonderful Bible teaching, David. Before you go, please tell those listening how they can find you on Patreon, where you have quite a collection of your Bible classes. Yeah, it's called uh, Dive Deep with Dave. Dive Deep with Dave. That's great. We're prepared prepared to do a lot of deep diving and uh, faith wrestling there. Hopefully (laughs) it should inspire some positive action in each of our lives. And what kind of topics have you covered there already? Oh, a lot of things. I did a series on apologetics called the Reasons for Belief series. And that one, there's about 13 episodes out of that. Wow. Then I did the Book of Romans, which basically was Paul's description of the gospel. That took us about 18 sessions to finish. (laughs) Then there's a couple of um, historical studies and ethical studies. And so there's there's quite a bit of stuff. up. Well, I'm looking forward to checking that out and getting some good Bible study time. (laughs) Looking forward to seeing you there. And you'll find a link to David's Patreon page below. Also, if you enjoy these podcasts and are a blessing to you, you can subscribe and hit the bell icon, and then you'll be notified every time we post a new show. Well, that's it for now, and I'm already looking forward to the next time we can be together for another Nightlight show. Until then, may God bless and keep you, and make you a blessing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.